Since time immemorial, or at least the 1970s, there's been a never-ending demand for higher quality, smoother graphics in video games. But the very earliest GPUs in game consoles weren't really GPUs at all. Instead of being general purpose microprocessors that we see in modern graphics cards, earlier video controllers were more or less hard coded to only output specific visuals for whatever video game it was a part of. It wasn't long though before real CPUs started to appear in video home game consoles. But for years, graphics processing in both consoles and computers was handled by the CPU itself instead of having a separate GPU. It wasn't until the mid 1980s that the modern concept of a discrete GPU started to take shape, including the Commodore Amiga's graphics subsystem that offloaded video tasks from the CPU and Texas Instruments rolling out the very uncreatively named TMS3401 in 1986, which was among the first of microprocessors specifically designed to render graphics on its own. But it wasn't until graphical user interfaces on computers were popularized by new operating systems like Windows that what we think of as PC graphics accelerators on an expansion card really took off instead of being relegated only to top-end workstations out of the reach of average consumers. One particularly popular early video card was the IBM 8514-A from 1987, which supported 256 colors and took care of common 2D rendering tasks like drawing lines on screens much faster than a regular CPU could handle. Thanks to its low cost, it spawned a number of clones and paved the way for further advances in 2D graphics. It was also around this time that a small Canadian company named ATI started producing its own graphics cards, notably the Wonder Series, one of the first consumer product lines to support multiple monitors, as well as the ability to switch between a number of different graphics modes and resolutions, which was uncommon at the time. But these early graphics cards still relied on the main CPU for quite a few tasks. And as 2D graphics became more complex in the early and mid 1990s, we started seeing more and more powerful GPUs that could work more independently of the CPU, as well as the emergence of Open Application Programming Interfaces, or APIs, including OpenGL in 1992, or say DirectX in 1995. These APIs enabled programmers to write code for them that would work on many different graphics adapters, really helping to push the gaming industry forward by providing somewhat of a standard software platform for game studios. Of course, the real excitement in this area was the possibility of bringing 3D graphics to home PCs. Although the 1995 release of the original PlayStation console, one of the first to support true 3D graphics, proved wildly successful, the PC side got off to a much slower start. One of the first 3D cards designed for consumer gaming was the S3 Verge, also released in 1995. Unfortunately, the Verge was more of a 2D card with 3D support kind of hastily added on and was notoriously so slow to the point where some gamers called the Verge a graphics decelerator. Not exactly flattering. Other cards like the 3DFX Voodoo from 1996 were actually 3D only, meaning that you need a separate card for day-to-day -day computing. Ugh. But at least the Voodoo was notable for being the first ever card to support multi-GPU setup. And its successor, the Voodoo 2 and its Glide API helped 3DFX become a dominant force in the late 1990s. As time went on, we saw improved features and performance from cards like the ATI Rage series that added DVD acceleration and the Matrox Mystique, which actually allowed you to add more VRAM, which you can't even do on modern cards. But the game really changed in 1999 when NVIDIA, previously known for cards like the Riva TNT, released the GeForce 256. Aside from it being the first ever GeForce card, it could process complex visuals that were previously left to the CPU, such as lighting effects and transformation, which maps 3D images onto a regular 2D monitor. Although the GeForce 256 was a little ahead of its time and many games didn't support its new features, it set the stage for the GeForce 2, which came out next year and became very popular. That same year, however, 3D effects disappeared from the consumer GPU market. Due to risky business decisions like attempting to manufacture its own cards to go with their GPUs and being unable to keep up with the performance of GeForce and ATI's new Radeon line. 
These two product stacks overwhelmed a once crowded GPU market. And in 2001, Nvidia and ATI were the only two real players remaining, unless of course you count Intel's integrated graphics. Although a few smaller companies remained, they gradually exited the consumer market over the next several years. Things continued to heat up in 2001 with the GeForce 3, which included a pixel shader that allowed for much more granular detail since it could produce effects on a per pixel basis. Not to be outdone, ATI quickly added this feature to its second generation of Radeon cards. For a while after, subsequent cards offered incremental performance improvements, though we did see a transition from the old AGP interface to the faster PCI Express interface in 2004, as well as NVIDIA SLI and ATI Crossfire in 2004 and 2005 respectively. But 2006 brought us a couple huge developments. ATI was bought out by AMD and Nvidia rolled out its famous 8800 GTX, an incredibly powerful and power hungry card that not only had a massive number of transistors, but a unified shader that could handle a large number of effects at once and run at a faster clock than the processing core as well as a number of stream processors that allowed graphical tasks to be parallelized to improve efficiency. The switch to stream processing allowed not only for a greater performance in games, but also general purpose or GP, GPU computing on graphics cards for things like scientific research and, hey, Bitcoin mining. AMD incorporated similar technology into its Radeon 2000 series a short while later. AMD was also the first to bring us the concept of surround gaming with up to six monitors at once with its iFinity brand in 2009, with Nvidia following this up in 2010 of course. 4K came along with both the red and the green team featuring support for it in 2012. We've certainly come a long way since the days of playing Pong in black and white, and who knows, maybe in 40 years we'll have something so advanced that Crisis 3 won't be noticeably harder to render than a ball bouncing around a black screen. Tunnel Bear VPN lets you tunnel to 20 different countries, allowing you to browse the internet and use online services as if you're in a different country. They have easy to use apps for iOS, Android, PC, and Mac. They even have a Chrome extension. Just choose a country in the app or extension, turn Tunnel Bear on and watch as your bear tunnels your internet connection to your new location. Your connection is encrypted with AES-256 encryption and your public IP address gets switched so you can show that you're in a different location. With TunnelBear, there's no weird port configurations or DNS settings or anything like that. TunnelBear handles all of that kind of stuff in the background. They also have a top rated privacy policy and do not log user activity. You can try out TunnelBear VPN with 500 megabytes of free data and with no credit card required. And if you like it and you want to upgrade to their unlimited plan, you can save 10% by going to tunnelbear.com slash Linus. All right, guys, thank you for watching. I know this was a rather long video, but it was a history of graphics cards, so it was important. Like the video if you liked it. Dislike it if you disliked it. Check out channel Super Fun. We have a video coming soon, but I can't really tell you guys what it is, but it's going to be cool, so go check it out. Comment down below with video suggestions, and don't forget, subscribe and follow.